Well, thank you, Tom, and, and good to, to see all of you on screen and recognize many familiar faces and names. And um, um, it's actually late here in Melbourne, 11 p.m., so you don't need to worry about me going overtime um, because um, it's late and it's winter and it's dark and it's cold. So um, let me go straight into sharing uh, slides for you. I come from a graphic design background, so I sort of feel like you always have to have something visual to be looking at. So um, I'll do that now, and then I'll explain what I plan to share with you uh, over the next hour. And I think you can see that, that slide all right. Um, Tom, someone tell me if you can't. So my topic, um, as advertised, is, is about uh, this idea of, of nationalism, um, embeddedness, I'll explain these, some of this uh, and identity. Uh, I'll be looking at particularly how this works in um, a study I've done on paradigm shift from sort of a Western missions context to more of a global missional movement. And again, explain that context. The context itself is a specific study um, that I've sort of finishing up or have been working on for some time. And it's, it's, a, it's a group of organizations called National Bible Translation Organizations. They're not actually called that anymore. And they um, have become affiliated with uh, the Wycliffe Global Alliance. And, I'm, and the issues of identity um, will come out in, in this study. So to, to give, give us a sense of uh, where I'm coming from, um, and because I live on this side of the world, I'm going to draw from some wisdom of the, the Maori of New Zealand. Um, and my Maori is not good at all, but they're, they're, they have a proverb that says, Kia wakatumuri te hayare wakamua. And literally, it's a saying that we travel backwards in time to the future and the present unfolds in front of us as a continuum of the past. Uh, I've heard people paraphrase it simply as I walk backwards into the future with my eyes fixed on the past. Um, I really actually like this proverb because um, it, it, whenever we're trying to look at the future and, and part of this study is the future mission, what might that look like? It seems to me we really have to look at the past and learn from that. And Andrew Walls is, somebody who many years ago, probably over 20 years ago, uh, must have come across the same proverb and he paraphrased it about how we speak of the future as being behind us because we can't see it. It's the past that's in front of us, stretched before us the most recent more plainly and the more distant fading away. Uh, this is going to be important in the study because I'm actually looking to the past and trying to gain some insights about how it might help us look into the future. But there's another aspect of the proverb I wanted to capture, and that is uh, from another Maori, uh, Leslie Ramaka. He says that in this proverb is the idea that ancestors are always ever present. Um, they exist both within the spiritual realm and in the physical, alongside the living as well as within the living. And Maori culture, as all Pacific Island cultures, uh, take great pride in, in ancestral heritage and the contribution of the ancestors is extremely important. Um, of course, it spreads on into animism, it spreads into uh, um, ancestral worship, spirits of the dead, et cetera. And that's not where I wanna go with this, with this proverb, but I do want to draw from the idea of the ancestors, not from a synchristic, syncretistic, uh, animistic way of blending with Christianity, but rather thinking of the value of the ancestors as we think of mission history, as we try to get pointers of looking to the future. Because in our ancestors, um, at least in the context of my study, most of these ancestors are not with us. They're, they're with the Lord. However, we have their journals, we have their reports, we even have board meeting minutes that go back to 1942. Uh, I've actually read them all the way up to 1993, not because I wanted some form of punishment, but because it was a basis of the study to see what were the ancestors, that being the leaders, saying, uh, what decisions were they making, and how is this going to start affecting 
uh, this whole question of identity and, and, and how um, movements were going to see themselves. So that's the background. That's where I'm coming from, looking, looking in this backward view, but drawing from this Maori uh, wisdom. Now, moving forward a little bit, because this journey, particular journey, really starts around the middle of the 20th century. And so when we look back to that, um, people like historian Dana Roberts, she describes the early to mid 1900s as the greatest period of cross-cultural expansion of the history of Christianity. She's of course not the only one who came to that conclusion. Um, others have referred to it as the tumultuous century because of the World War, the World Wars, the Great Depression, resurgent Islam, rising nationalism. Um, and mission, in, mission endeavors, mission agencies encountered many trials uh, in this eventful period, and yet it was extremely fruitful. Now, the point I wanted to draw out was um, also what Robert captures, Dana Robert captures, and that is in the 60s was this rising voice of young nationalists growing louder in regional and international church councils who were starting to accuse the Western missionaries of paternalism and also failing to turn over church leadership structures to national control. A decade later, a book was written by an author named Pius Wakatama from Rhodesia at the time, Zimbabwe today, and he was calling for a moratorium on foreign missionary efforts in Africa. Uh, actually, he was, drew his analysis from a meeting of anthropologists, secular anthropologists in Barbados in 1971, who were really getting concerned and bothered about Western missionaries uh, working amongst the Indians in Latin America and accusing them of destroying the cultures, the indigenous cultures. And Wakatama makes it clear in his book that he did not actually agree with this group's assumptions, however, uh, for, for many reasons. However, he was wondering if there was some sort of substance to the charge. Was there something worth exploring or considering? Um, Robert also, Dana Robert also recognized that even in the 70s, the leaders of Christian councils in South Pacific, South Asia, Latin Af America and Africa were all calling for moratorium on the sending of foreign missionaries so they could break this long-term pattern of dependency that had been established in the colonial era. Now, according to Wakatama, the main reason for his call for a moratorium was that he said Africans wanted foreign missionaries to leave because the missionaries had brought this gospel in, wrapped in a cumbersome paraphernalia of Western culture. He also noted how the mission agency themselves were not multiracial nor multicultural, and that their mission leadership was often detracting from the national church through financial and other types of control. And it was only a few Africans that actually thought the missions had been successful in, in their responsibilities, and therefore they could also successfully leave. So Wakatama writes this book in the mid-70s. He comes from the context of actually southern Rhodesia. It had just become a self-declared independent country of Rhodesia under the white minority government, Ian Smith. This was long before Robert Mugabe. Now, Another uh, work worth considering was in 1971, uh, John Gapu of Kenya, serving as the General Secretary of the Presbyterian Church of East Africa. He called for changes to how Western missions and the churches they started were conducting ministry in Africa. And he stated at a conference in New York, and I quote, we cannot build the church in Africa on alms given by overseas churches. We are not serving the cause of the kingdom by turning all bishops, general secretaries, moderators, presidents, and superintendents into good, enthusiastic beggars when we continuously sing the tune of poverty in the third world churches. So Gatu, um, in his work and his actually his whole life, he championed the principles of selfhood, self-reliance, self-determination for the church. And this became known at the time and spread across the world as was called the moratorium debate. And um, he actually felt, uh, reflecting in his, in his autobiography, which came out a couple of years ago, that this call for the moratorium actually helped many um, mission agencies re-examine 
at their relevance in the changing world. Uh, so he saw good in it. He saw that um, that uh, you know by calling for this moratorium that it actually was causing some of the agencies to reconsider their model. He noticed um, that so much of what the Western missionaries were raising in terms of money was going to salaries and maintenance of the Western missionary structure, but it wasn't going to help or support or build sustainability in the African church. So the call for the moratorium sought to, uh, this demand of the uh, tr massive transfer amounts of money spent on expatriate personnel to churches in Africa. Now, there were lots of critics of the moratorium. For example, Samuel Gattari notes how even Professor Stephen Neal, the famous Stephen Neal, then at the University of Ni Nairobi, once vilified Gattu as an ecclesiastic Idi Amin after the notorious Ugandan dictator. Even Johannes Verkeel from the Netherlands stated how the debate was causing Western young people to reconsider missionary service. And it was even beginning to affect fundraising in Europe for mission in Africa. Herbert Works describes the moratorium as a tragic concept that would turn the evangelical world away from worldwide evangelization. And even Billy Graham, in his opening address to the Lausanne 1974 conference, called for the very idea of the moratorium to be rejected, and instead that churches of every land should deliberately send out evangelists and missionaries to master other languages, learn other cultures, live them in them, perhaps for life, and thus evangelize these multitudes. So did the critic, the critique of the presence and activity of Western-based missionaries and their agencies in Africa, the Pacific, Latin America, and Asia, affect the structures of these agencies? And in particular, the focus of my study, did it affect Bible translation organizations who had a very big footprint across these same regions? And in particular, with the Bible translators and its strategic partner, SIL. So now I'll, I'll dig a bit into that theme. I'm going to uh, give you through a graphic that I'll be building uh, through the rest of the presentation um, this, this framework of, of this progression, if you will, uh, um, that uh, covers Western missions, nationalism, colonialism, and these time frames. Um, now, if we look at the 20th century, Edward Smyther in his recent work looks at how this century was noted for its innovation and new strategies and a number of new organizations reflected this. And he even uh, considers William Cameron Townsend's founding of Wycliffe and SIL as part of that um, because he, he felt that Townsend and his colleagues were on the cutting edge, particularly of language and language development. But uh, Townsend and his colleagues were also operating in this shifting wind that was blowing of colonialism uh, that was kind of blowing out and then nationalism that was blowing in more strongly. And these things were happening, uh, particularly after World War II, 1945 to 1965 was when we saw so many dependent nations, colonized nations, pressing for and gaining independence from the colonizers. And since Wycliffe was founded in 1942, was internationalizing by 1950 and spread, which was spreading its roots from the US to the Western world, it was naturally gonna be affected by these winds. The question is really how? And so that, that, that will be a part of what will come out in a moment. Um, I would make a, a side comment here because you've, we've recently heard from Michael Stroop uh, a couple of weeks ago on one of these lectures. And it's important to note the linkage between colonialism and the spread of Christianity that's been embedded in the language of mission. I think Stroop in his, his, his own work has really tried to bring this out, this tie that's making, he says, a younger generation more and more uncomfortable with the church's mission language because mission is meaning for them colonization and Western imperialism. Um, so we'll keep that in the background uh, as we proceed. Now in this, in this background, uh, as we look at Wycliffe and SIL dynamic, um, and forgive, if you don't understand Wycliffe and SIL and its confusing structure, uh, you'll get to understand a little bit better just as we walk through some of this. 
but what what was going on uh, for the founder Townsend in this period of 1945, 1965. And from that, I draw from one of Townsend's biographers who says that um, the rising nationalism and reaction against American internationalism made the securing of visas more difficult for agencies like SIL. Many governments were unwilling to allow expatriate mission workers into their countries unless they were highly credentialed. Furthermore, many governments wanted their own people trained in linguistics and Bible translation. They also wanted SIL to be in a position of accountability for translators to work under the authority of recognized government agencies. Now, at the time, SIL received all of its personnel from Wycliffe divisions. These were the home offices, the sending offices. And these people were sent from Wycliffe to SIL and ended up in places like the territory of Papua New Guinea. Uh, where my parents w went with Wycliffe and SIL in 1958 as an example. Uh, so countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Philippines, nations in Latin and South America. And <clears throat> these, the leaders of these agencies, SIL and Wycliffe, were naturally taking note of what was happening to these nations as they were gaining self-governance and independence from their colonizers. And so the rising question became, in this time frame, if you look at the historical records, was a growing conversation about uh, how to involve local citizens in these translation projects. Uh, these uh, discussions were consistent with uh, Townsend's view that his people should um, form sponsoring committees of national leaders, educators, and scholars to speak on SIL's behalf. So in some parts of the world, SIL actually helped start local agencies and that's what became known as the National Bible Translation Organizations. But this was not actually lost on Townsend. So he didn't actually have something directly to do with it, even though he was general director. For example, he wrote in 1979 to his leaders and he asked them to have extreme caution and pointed out the dangers inherent in hiring national translators or investing foreign funds in National Bible Translation Organizations. And so you have this growing tension of this Western mission that's becoming internationalized, this partner, unique partnership between two of these international bodies, Wycliffe and SIL, and this new development of this category called National Bible Translation Organizations. But why was Townsend worried about this nationalism uh, rising where SIL was working? Well, we can gain some, some insights in, into this a little bit earlier. Uh, in 1973, at one of their big international conferences, there the leaders talked about how to stimulate local citizens to become involved in forwarding linguistics, literacy, and Bible translation work. And so two options were discussed. The first option was, well, where these local citizens exist, and there were still Bible translation needs, then SIL would want to encourage the formation of a national organization. But in case places where there was interest in local citizens working as members of SIL, they could be accepted only if there was the existence of a Wycliffe Home Division or a local committee that could channel their support. Unless there was a satisfactory option, um, there could also be another sponsoring organization. So actually it became more of the first option that cleared the way for the development of what I will uh, call the NBTOs, the National Bible Translation Organizations. SIL and WBT wanted the NBTOs structured under either existing church councils, so these bodies would actually promote uh, the work and oversee translation work. They assumed that many SIL uh, translators would shift from their traditional work as a single team to occupy roles as facilitators and trainers of nationals. So this direction uh, that was taking place under Townsend's nose actually started causing him great concerns. Um, for example, when the highest um, body for decision making in Wycliffe and SIL, this was called at the time the Corporation Conference, was setting this direction for nationals, Townsend became more and more worried. He was worried that it meant that the Western church would abdicate its responsibility to be the major provider of translated scriptures for the world's ethnic communities, end of quote. Those are his quotes. 
So this disturbed him so much that he wrote a prayer. And this was recorded. It's been documented. It's a long prayer. I won't go into it uh, other than a couple of quotes. Um, basically, in this prayer, he's saying to the Lord, um, is the day of expatriates actually over? Uh, he's thinking about the winds of nationalism, and, and he's pouring his heart out to the Lord. He's even quoting the Great Commission. Isn't that still relevant? Um, are we to give an excuse uh, to the anti-foreign attitude of countries that refuse to grant visas to missionaries? Are we going to look to God, him who told us to go, and say, Lord, although it's true that there are many languages that without the Bible, the government won't let us in? So we can't go, so we've decided to give it to the nationals and expect them to do this. Please, Lord, don't think we have decided to pass the buck and let the nationals do it, even though that makes a lot of sense. And, and he talks uh, to the Lord about the adequate training that they actually can receive, uh, even through his own colleagues. And so his biggest concern as he ends his prayer is, please, Lord, we aren't passing the buck as these, he, he probably understands nationals are going to hold more and more roles, but he doesn't want the Lord to think that somehow he and the, the Western colleagues are abdicating the responsibilities. He held the conviction that nationals should remain independent of Wycliffe and SIL. Um, he did not want them to be uh, mistreated because he believed his own colleagues would mistreat nationals. Uh, these are quotes from him. He, he did not believe, he did not trust his own colleagues uh, to do the right thing with nationals. He believed that uh, nationals would be better off free of external control, that these national organizations should have full responsibility for their whole programs. And that way, SIL would avoid having any colonial attitudes towards them. And, he, and it would also keep any cross-cultural tensions in check. Um, Townsend believed that a mixed membership, that is his agencies having people who are Western as well as citizens from these other countries with this mixed membership could lead to accusations of paternalism if the foreign personnel were in control of the national organizations or the nationals were in control of the foreign organizations. So he called for the solution was that the expatriates should have totally separate organizations from the local citizens. And so this, this is this growing tension that's starting to take place within the dynamic of Wycliffe and SIL when the founder himself is deeply troubled by the missiological uh, things that are happening around him in terms of this rising independence movement, rising uh, interests of national Christians to take uh, leadership and ownership of this particular ministry. And so, um, coupled with that, I would also add more as a footnote that in the 60s and 70s, we also see really the turning point in the internationalization of Christian mission. By the 60s and 70s, it was arguably no longer just Americans and Brits, but it was also uh, people from across Europe, uh, a steady stream of Australians and New Zealanders and white South Africans. And so we could say Western mission had become internationalized. But to help drill down on this national debate, I want to do a, a short case study on one context, and that's the context of Ghana. Sorry, that's my microphone. Um, in the context of Ghana, uh, we go back to 1973, and this is uh, when um, the, the conference of Wycliffe and SIL had decided that um, they were going to really grapple with this question of what they called national involvement. That, that is the strategy of encouraging local citizens to be more engaged at this, in the two organizations. And that's officially where this National Bible Translation Organization concept was, was created. Um, and so even though Townsend didn't have a vision for this and, and having a vision of, them, of the NBTO somehow being incorporated it did not actually stop this from happening. Uh, and Ghana would be the place to start. Wycliffe International formally recognized Ghana Institute of Linguistics as an NBTO in 1980 when SIL in Ghana changed its name in recognition of its national Ghanaian, Ghanaian identity. And this was unique in the time 
in the world of SIL. Now, Gilbert's, uh, I'll just call it Gilbert, that's the Ghana Institute of Linguistics, Literacy and Bible Translation. Uh, we love acronyms in Wycliffe and SIL. Its roots go back to 1960 when the late Ghanaian statesman, John Komla Agama, uh, was actually asked SIL, he, went, he was in the UK studying, he went to the British Council and he asked them to consider sending Brits to Ghana. Uh, of course, Ghana uh, was newly independent and uh, from, from the UK, and so there was naturally uh, close links. Um, but the, the British Council said they had no plans uh, for Ghana to send anyone there, but the need was noted. And actually within the year, the British SIL school director, um, Dr. John Bender Samuel, uh, you might recognize that name, went to West Africa to evaluate the situation. Um, when he arrived uh, in 1961, um, it was 18 months after Ghana had received its independence. And it was the first African nation in south of the Sahara to do so. Uh, Bender Samuel's focus being with SIL was to work with the University of Ghana to create a memorandum. So he did that and within a year, some British members started arriving. But this agreement was actually built on the vision of Ghanaian leaders like Agama, but also Pa Willy Afora, Afori Atta, a very well-known name in Ghana, and Gottfried Ose Mensah. Bender Samuel had created a close friendship with these statesmen who had national aspirations to develop and use the nation's languages as a platform for intellectual, political, economic, and spiritual transformation of their, of the, their people. And so there was this very uh, close affiliation and friendship. Now, uh, later on, we move forward to 1991, when Wycliffe International was restructured, Gilbert became part of this restructuring, and it was actually given status of what we called at the time a Wycliffe member organization. Uh, but nonetheless, it had this interesting identity of uh, being very closely affiliated with SIL because of its historical roots. Um, there was a lot of challenges in Ghana over the years, it had many crises, it had many identity issues, and when I did an analysis of it a number of years ago, what I discovered was the identity issues were tied to the fact that originally it had the DNA of SIL, but it had kind of given that up due to the nationalism taking place. It had been brought into the Wycliffe family, but it didn't even understand that family. Um, it probably wasn't any integration or orientation for that matter. And so it had a national mandate and aspiration to serve its country. It wanted to do that well and, and be well trained to do it, but it just didn't know where it fit in terms of identity in this uh, unique structure. So now as, as we keep working on this framework, um, we're at the point where we can, we can bring the Wycliffe and SIL dynamic with the NBTOs into this earlier uh, period of time around the 70s and 80s. Um, and up until this time, the history of these organizations was actually primarily written from an SIL perspective. It was about the language programs. It was about linguistics and translation. Wycliffe was a footnote because Wycliffe was only there to somehow make SIL possible. But as these national organizations started developing, they really needed a home and SIL didn't want them. Uh, there's a lot of technical reasons for this. SIL was a singular organization. It did not relate uh, directly to the local churches and the NBTOs needed to. They needed to be owned by, so to speak, by the, their local churches. And so that sounded more like what Wycliffe does, even though Wycliffe didn't do translation work in these countries. It did a recruitment in its home countries like the UK, for example. So in this period of time, these NPTOs, which were growing in number, find themselves being embraced by Wycliffe International, rejected by SIL International, but were actually birthed by SIL International. So if you're thinking about complex identity issues in these leaders and their boards and even in their staff. It starts to become clear why, why this is a problem. And so 
what was going on, even in a simplistic way in, in this organizational framework, was that SIL did the field work, Wycliffe ra raised the recruits for that field work. Well, what were the MBTOs? Well, they were actually a bit of both, and they were local, and they weren't going to get kicked out of their country like was happening in some parts of the world at the time, particularly for SIL. So um, as, as many uh, leaders looking back, uh, any, many of the ancestors describing this history say, the NBTOs were spawned by SIL in various countries, but SIL was unable to incorporate them in their structures because they were religious organizations. And so we move into the, the whole issue of complexity uh, complexity affects relationships, it affects identity and responsibility. And so these NBTOs were, were caught in this, this sit changing situation. And they were caught in this situation of the, what Wycliffe does, raising its resources, what SIL does in its field work. And yet, the, as I said before, they kept finding themselves doing both. They had their own language programs they were in charge of. They had to find their own recruits, and they actually had to raise their own resources as well. And so we're now moving along to uh, further along. We're past the internationalization phase of our framework. Uh, that is now well taking place. The Western missions have become international. Nationalism is changing. Colonialism is shifting. Uh, we're hearing more about neo-colonialism, for example, and we, in, in this framework for this particular uh, discussion, the NBTOs are there and they're kind of wondering where they belong. So the, the concerns of the town, of Townsend actually did not dissipate, even though these national organizations uh, kept growing and emerging. He, he actually probably, from my understanding, went to his grave deeply distressed um, that, that this was taking place. Um, he did not want them to be part of Wycliffe Bible translators, at least not in the foreseeable future. And it probably wasn't meant to be a racist thought. It was more probably that he was concerned how they would be treated, that they would probably not be treated as equals um, because he did not believe that his own people would look, look after them very well. But the NBTOs kept growing. In fact, they grew to the extent that they could even have their first international conference. And they, um, it, it, it actually illustrates a quote from um, uh, Christine Kim, who notes that the Christian faith is not imported, but emerges out of local experiences. So what's going on is that uh, through the translation efforts itself, through the growth of the church worldwide, through the global south emerging, uh, national organizations, national Christians were forming their own organizations to participate because that's what they felt God was calling them to do. If they couldn't be part of a current structure, then they had to find another way. And so by the mid-70s, uh, these organizations were emerging, and they actually all had very unique names. For example, we have the Nigeria Bible Translation Trust, the Bible Translation and Literacy of East Africa, based in Kenya, or the Bible Translation Association of Papua New Guinea. And each of these organizations was unique. It had its own aspirations. It did not look like the other, but it was all birthed in this context of the SIL model. And they gathered for their first conference in May 1985, and there were 11 organizations that came. And uh, Emmanuel Njok, a Cameroonian, who was also on the Wycliffe International Board at the time, he reported at the international conference uh, later that year about uh, this, this gathering. But he also pointed out the realization of these NBTOs that they held these two functions. They functioned like Wycliffe and they functioned like SIL. Um, and so they actually needed to become more financially sustainable because most of their funding was coming through SIL and therefore from the West. And so uh, as a result of this conference, uh, it was decided that SIL and Wycliffe would fully commit themselves to par partner with the NBTOs. Uh, the founder is now dead by three years. So, you know, once the founder goes, um, people move on. And so th these NBTOs were embraced. There was a motion passed, a statement of commitment to present a priority uh, to relate to these organizations. 
um, there was a mandate given to the international leaders uh, that they needed to engage with these organizations. In fact, some of the leaders even noted in their strategies that they would put a particular focus uh, on engaging these national organizations. In the report given after the conference, the president at the time, David Cummings from Australia, wrote to the friends of Wycliffe and SIL, and he said, one of the most significant things that happened in this conference is we got to hear about the first international conference of the NVTOs, and what an amazing thing was going on. He talks about how the Lord was encouraging these groups and how exciting this information or development was. Then the NBTOs had their second conference in 1989 in Mombasa. And, um, and then by 1990, Wycliffe and SIL decided it's time to strengthen these NBTOs and to put them uh, properly within the Wycliffe international structure. Interestingly, none of, the internet, none of the NBTO leaders were ever asked whether that was a good idea, whether that's what they wanted. Instead, the decision was made for them you fit better in Wycliffe than SIL, so we're putting you over in Wycliffe. And uh, it turns out decades later, some of the, those leaders are still alive, um, a little bit resentful that they were not actually uh, uh, consulted in that decision. Um, but that's how things worked, and that's probably part of Townsend's um, concerns of how uh, these national leaders would be treated. Now, I want to make another side note and talk briefly about the whole idea of agency for national organizations. And, and I don't mean, uh, of course, the English word agency has a few different meanings, but I don't mean the agency in terms of an institutional structure, but I'm thinking of the idea to have capacity to act or to exert power. As some authors talk about agency being needed to, for freedom to make unrestricted and independent choices when individuals and groups express themselves fully, that they need agency to determine their own futures and forge their own identities. They need agency to contribute meaningfully. And so the question arises in my mind is, did the NBTOs feel like they had agency? Did they feel like either Wycliffe or SIL, and it turned out to be Wycliffe, was giving them agency so they could chart their own course, establish their own identity, make their own choices? Or was it possible that they did not see themselves as equals with their international partners? A critical question for the NBTOs was, had they become financially dependent on Western sources? Uh, and yes, they had. And that was a big problem for them. It was going to be, continue to be a problem as long as this, this dependency was an issue. Now, if we had time, um, we could look at a few of the NBTOs at the time. So this is back to that original list in the first conference, uh, or actually the second conference. I've bolded some of the ones that I've actually done some, some research on. And I'll, I'll just give you one, one example. Um, uh, so many of these are actually functioning, but I'll, I'll pick on one that, uh, that is no longer functioning. And that's the one in Cote d'Ivoire. It was started in the mid-1980s with the rationale that a local institution would be needed if SIL had to leave the country, because that's actually what was done in Nigeria. Uh, SIL found itself at very short notice, had to leave its center in Joss because it wasn't uh, involving enough Nigerians. It was given very short notice and so very quickly turned its property over to Nigerian Christians. They formed a trust and they took hold of that property and SIL left. Later on, SIL came back, but not to that property. And meanwhile, this NBTO called NBTT had formed. But in Cote d'Ivoire, it was a different situation, but similar idea. Just in case SIL gets kicked out of the country, let's have a national organization. However, um, it was not a grassroots movement. It was not empowered to equip, equip to do anything. Um, it was, its name was used to do publishing by SIL, but it was really just um, a, a window shop, it, it, it just a front for activity for SIL. And eventually it died. Uh, it was not successful, uh, became dormant, and was never officially recognized. Now, fortunately, not all of these turn out that way, but it, it shows you what happens in that DNA uh, when, when some of these things are formed, the reasons behind them, and then how that plays out. 
but again, I don't have time to go into those, but those are just the examples, some of the names, um, and, and many are, are still functioning, uh, many have not worked out. So we're, we're now uh, moving along in this framework of, of how these evolving structures and relationships in, in the internationalization process are still working themselves out, particularly in, in trying to involve national organizations. Now, the big change happened in this framework, in this journey in 1991, because that's when Wycliffe International was able to be restructured to become an organization of organizations or umbrella of organizations. It was no longer uh, controlled from the United States where it had originated. It was now uh, this collective, so to speak. And that was actually freeing it up to, to be more adaptable in its structure. And around the same time, the NBTOs started becoming called Wycliffe affiliate organizations. There were other organizations called Wycliffe member organizations, uh, they called Wycliffe organizations and Wycliffe member organizations. Sorry about, sorry about all the terminology, but it's mainly to illustrate the second class citizen uh, effect happening because you had the original, the, the Western and, and Asian, the sending, they were called the member organization. Then you had this NBTO that spawned by SL, brought into Wycliffe, and they were called the affiliates. Uh, you can imagine what that did for identity and DNA for those organizations, still reinforcing very much a, a second class citizen effect. And so this debate of inclusion, how will these organizations be included into this new structure of Wycliffe and International was one that went on for years and years. Um, and interestingly, um, discovering for about 20 years, the term NBTO and Wycliffe affiliate was used interchangeably because it depended on who was speaking and there was no consensus on what the new term meant um, and it was hard to get rid of the old term. And so this, this idea of who are we uh, was, was a, a sore point. The NBTOs themselves said, you invite us to your international meetings, but we're not included because we don't get the same representation. And this was pointed out over and over again. And it actually took years and years uh, to resolve that. And, and again, just to, to <clears throat> you know, illustrate um, the idea that we, we were just dealing with uh, an issue of local or ownership. And so, um, and, and I need to wrap up soon. So as I, as I head into that direction of wrapping this together, I uh, wanted to touch briefly, uh, going back to the whole idea of identity, um, we could look at it from an African point of view and we could talk about Africanization or nationalization. We could also uh, look at um, embeddedness, uh, the idea that a, a vision is embedded in a local expression, a local identity. And this idea of, of a shift from, from um, Western mission to, in the African case, in the Ghana case, to Africanization was a key one for Gilbert, going back to Gilbert, because Gilbert realized that while it related to SIL, it had become an NBTO, it was self-governing, and now it was part of Wycliffe International. And that allowed it to be more directly involved with the Ghanaian church. Up until then, that was not really considered a priority. And so in time, Gilbert was able to see itself as an implementing agency of the Ghanaian church. This was part of its journey of Africanization, of, of seeing itself as truly an African agency, an African ministry, African connected to the African church. Africanization of Bible translation, if you will. And so this uh, was an important development uh, in, in for them. And included in that was the whole issue of embeddedness, uh, embeddedness within Africanization, embeddedness in the sense that the Ghanaian church saw Bible translation as just part and parcel of its ministry. It, it was embedded within the context of ministry for the Ghanaian church. And this was a difficult journey, and it probably hasn't even really been successful because in the conversations with the Ghanaian church with Gilbert often was, but Gilbert, you are really SIL, you are really foreign, you really don't need our help, you're doing a good job, when you're finished, we'll use the translation. That was not embeddedness. And so this was the uphill battle that Gilbert has been 
uh, pushing for a long time, but it comes back to identity. Its identity had been through this Western framework. It was trying to re-identify as Ghanaian, and yet its Ghanaian partners, the church, uh, did not accept that or did not see that, uh, did not fund it, um, and, and really uh, were, were only marginally involved. And uh, people who've reflected a little bit on this um, categorize it a little bit like this, that um, much of what was taking place in Ghana was actually led from a Western missionary paradigm. And the Western missionary paradigm was one where the missionary brought all the resources, all the funds and the networks and you name it, the institutional structures, the building, the cars, it was all brought to Ghana as a, as a sort of uh, a plan to, to implement a, a vision in Ghana. And this was the paradigm, this worked. It's how it worked, it's how it was funded. It was successful in so many parts of the world. But for the NBTO, Gilbert, it became a major problem. It hit a crisis point a number of years ago when the foreigners didn't even wanna be identified in this national organization. They, they struggled even being under a national leader. No wonder Townsend had been worried so many years earlier. At the same time, this Christian nationalist paradigm uh, was rising up. And, and we can sometimes be concerned about that. Uh, is it a Marxist agenda? Is it a liberation agenda? Or is it more possibly an expression that um, it's organic, it's indigenous, it's locally owned, uh, it's gonna be done differently, and from a Western point of view, probably uh, not efficient, but it will be locally owned, embedded, and used, uh, particularly in, in when you think of the scriptures. And this was the shift that NB, uh, Gilbert has been trying to lead uh, for the last 15 years or last five years or so, not necessarily very successfully because of the DNA. Uh, in, in my uh, research with Gilbert many years ago, they kept talking about the SIL DNA in them. Uh, it wasn't like you could get rid of it. It wasn't like they even wanted to get rid of it because there was strength in it, but it was the stumbling block that stopped them from being accepted more broadly within their own context. Um, and so this, this is this shift, this tension, uh, paradigms always shift, paradigm shifts always have tension in them. They're never clean cut, but this would be just an example of how it affects identity. And then we could also, um, you know, illustrate it ag again this way, uh, this tension between the organizational structures and then uh, the, the, um, the paradigm shifts. And moving very quickly then, well, what have been the effects of the moratorium declaration? We go back to 1976, kind of where we started with Pius Wakatama's book. Uh, what, what's really happened? Uh, has there just been lip service to a rethinking, uh, a reevaluation by the international, now global agencies that don't just have Westerners in them, but they are global movements, they are global missions, they're global agencies. Uh, have they really done a reevaluation, a rethink? Have they really embedded the local or national expression into their structures? And it seems that it's possible that there's just been a lot of lip service. There's probably been a lot of maintaining of structures. There's probably not been enough of decolonization of DNA. And there's probably a lot of baggage these national organizations in this particular structure I'm speaking of are going to carry for a long time and it's gonna affect their effectiveness. Um, and I'm almost done. Uh, so prepare for, for questions or comments if you have it in a moment. Um, recently in April this year, we did some research uh, because of COVID-19 uh, with a hundred organizations that are part of the Wycliffe Global Alliance. But I drew out of that research for this study, what did these former NBTOs who had become Wycliffe affiliates and then their name was changed later to Alliance organizations when it became the Wycliffe Global Alliance and they're all equal with everybody else. I was able to draw their uh, reports aside from this survey to see how were these organizations seeing COVID crisis and particularly how it was gonna affect their ministry looking forward. And what I found, and, and I think there were about six or seven organizations that fit that category, the original NBTOs that are still now functioning in the Wycliffe Global Alliance. 
that they saw incredible instability in their funding. And this was in April, so you can imagine what it might be like. They saw a lot of lack of resources um, because the local churches were being decimated um, and this was affecting them. And then their Western partners were pulling out. But some saw the new opportunities. Many spoke about the vulnerability of, of their ministry uh, in, in, in a sense, um, in a good way, a humble way, a sense of, you know, it's God who, who owns this ministry. We don't know what he's up to, but we, we look in with anticipation of what he might be doing. And, the, and many spoke of the potential within the local communities. Um, now, that should have happened maybe 30 years ago, but nonetheless, it was a start. And interestingly, uh, many commented on re the realization we are now global and therefore interconnected. If we are struggling and suffering in Burkina Faso as a, as a small uh, national organization, guess what? We're actually part uh, connected to Wycliffe USA who has far more resources. They're probably struggling too. We're interconnected now. We certainly never saw that kind of conversation before. So finishing up with this framework, um, which kind of hopefully ties many of these thoughts together, is that we're now um, charting this out and, and up to 2020 where we're in terms of colonialism, you know, we're often talking about post-colonialism, nationalism is there sometimes, but not necessarily there. And perhaps we're talking structurally more about some sort of global movements rather than these strong, uh, formerly Western institutional structures. And in the Wycliffe SIL journey with the NBTOs, we, we see played out all of this in them. Uh, we see uh, their aspirations for inclusion within their own national context, but retaining tension with their Western roots. We see the journey being largely shaped by the ancestors, whether it was the founder Townsend or John Gama in, in Ghana, uh, David Gala in Papua New Guinea. Uh, these ancestors had a lot of influence that still shape these agencies today. The moratorium question of the 1970s is still a valuable question to ask, not necessarily of Western missionaries, perhaps the whole missionary enterprise of today. Brian Stanley states that history is all about change and the writing of history seeks to explain the process of change. So the writing of the history of the NBTOs, which, most of which, by the way, has never ever been documented before, uh, it's part of a larger research project going on, uh, certainly not in one place, uh, is helping us gain a better understanding of this identity issue for national Christians and particularly in the formation of local expressions who then eventually end up participating in global bodies and movements. So through these lenses of history, looking backwards with our Maori proverb, we get an outline of the place where we've come uh, where we are now, and maybe some hints of what lies ahead and some of those tensions that are still there, uh, but perhaps we are more uh, better informed, perhaps, and the next generation of leaders from across the globe will be better placed uh, to take this forward. So at that point, I'm done. Uh, I'll turn, turn it back to Tom. Tom, I believe you'll moderate this, and, and I'll stop sharing the slides. We can always come back to it if we need to. Yeah, so go ahead and, and put up the, if you open your participant page, um, there's a little thing that says raise your hand and you can do that. Uh, let me start off with a little bit of a comment and just some thoughts, Kirk. Absolutely fascinating lecture. And what I found in Singapore was kind of looking across from another side and, and, and I know that there's almost a chapter there that you could bring in, and that's the rise of the indigenous churches. So, and, and they begin part of Western churches. So you have the Anglican church in, 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 in Singapore, Presbyterian churches and that kind of thing. And at the beginning, they're the small fries. So basically the mission organizations and institutions almost ignore them. When you talk to church people, they go, we were nobodies, you know? And, and they, they were frustrated because, you know, there was this idea that we're supposed to be building the church, and yet the churches themselves were kind of secondary. During my tenure, that shifts so that by the time I'm there, it's the churches that are really powerful. 
and the independent mission agencies like SIL, Wycliffe and everything are trying to find a home. And UBS, United Bible Societies, IFES and others, and they begin to form the churches. And then that frames a whole nother sense of identity. Further within their own cultures and nations, they become the key conduit to non-Christian members of society. So they're the ones who, when, you know, one thing about people who aren't Christians who are in Singapore, they go, who, you know, who are all these organizations and what do they all represent? They're like mosquitoes. Who do I, which one do I talk to? All right. So, so in that sense, Kirk, where do you see that kind of identity framework of the local churches in terms of that grid you are setting up in terms of a sense of national identity, but the national identity founded in the body of Christ, even in their different denominational frameworks within the nations. And you're muted right now, Kirk, so unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for that, Tom. Um, well, I would have to say that that this framework um, right now probably excludes them too much. Um, and it's worth uh, pondering more. Uh, on the other hand, one of the developments uh, we've seen in the global movement um, aspect of, of this framework, which is the last part, is that uh, increasingly the church denominations are finding ways to participate in something they believe in. So if Bible translations, I'll just use that example, is important to them, they've been able to find a way of participating because the structures were changed to such a degree that they no longer had to have that original DNA, but rather they were participating together because they wanted to see the scriptures available in their language, in their countries, and they wanted to take charge of that. That's been a big development. For example, in Indonesia, uh, six church denominations are participating in that way. They don't actually need the Wycliffe Global Alliance organizational structure, but it was probably more a catalyst for them. Mm. Um, in time, they will take the lead. And in time, in a country like Indonesia, the local national organization there, it's actually already reformed. It's uh, rebirthing itself to serve this church movement. Um, seeing similar things in Brazil, uh, Sudan, other parts of the world, Ethiopia. So I think in time, what, what happens is that the, the, this global part of the framework uh, simply stops being about the former Western mission agencies and really more about the global church. Uh, so I think it's something worth, worth exploring some more. Um, I'm gonna turn to Andres and I'm lowering your hand. Andres, go ahead and mute yourself and ask a question, Andres. Thank you. This was very good. Um, my question is how the polycentric model that you have pioneered in Wycliffe, in the Wycliffe Alliance, address the issues of uh, internationalization and integration of global partners and help eliminate the second tier uh, kind of uh, idea, category of deal? Wow, thank you, Andres. Um, I'm impressed uh, that you've picked up on that and, and I excluded it. Um, and that's probably an area that um, would come out in, in further uh, study um, because polycentricism as a concept, a way of thinking, which really by definition simply means multiple centers of influence. I would add polyphonic as well to that, so many voices. Um, you could even add polychronic, many colors. Um, you just take the as far as you like, perhaps. But just taking polycentricism, the way it's helped us uh, in some parts of the world is to, in particularly Latin America, is to say Latin America is not one center. There's the Caribbean. There's Brazil. There's uh, the Mexico influence. There's Central American influence. And but together they can work together and, and respect each other but they're given a lot of uh, leadership autonomy uh, because of these, this, this, um, there's, there's unity in the diversity of, of all this uh, polycentricism. Um, I think it's there in Africa when you think of the Francophone context, the Lusophone context, the Anglophone context, and then throw in Ethiopia, uh, you know, its own center of influence. The problem might be that we don't always know what to do with this vision or model. How do we lead it? Um, 
and, and I've had leaders I've worked with who really got it and actually took it much farther than I could, and others who just say, no, this is too abstract, this is too ethereal, it, it doesn't really make sense, it's not practical. But I do remember working with a bunch of leaders um, based in, Me um, in a consultation in Mexico a number of years, just walking through the idea that we were no longer uniform. Decisions weren't made in one part of the world, sent somewhere else. But through polycentric way of thinking, local expressions gathering together uh, could actually influence leadership decisions and strategies and ways of doing ministry uh, in a collective sense, and yet respecting the fact that they were quite different. Say, Latin America and Central America was very different to North America, and that was fine. Um, that was acceptable. So, Andres, I think we're probably, in my view, we're still very early on in, in that. I'm now starting to see some doctorate research done by other uh, mission leaders taking the polycentric model a little bit deeper. It'll be interesting to see uh, how they implement that in their own agency. I actually think there's a lot of good in, in, in the idea, and it's worth uh, seeing how, how does this help us uh, consider the complexity of the global church uh, it, that would be one a model or paradigm we could think of it in. Okay, I'm going to turn to Chris Morton. Go ahead, Chris. I've lowered your hand, so go ahead, unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, thank you. That was uh, incredibly fascinating. Um, I've been with the Navigators for 22 years, and so the history of Wycliffe is something that uh, we've always enjoyed and uh, loved. I, I didn't know the path you took down. But in going through our own history and then period of time when I served on aid on our, internet, uh, our leadership team, two things kept on coming up. Uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the biggest concern in relinquishing control was liberation theology. That kept on coming up. And, and, and that was a particular concern for Americans giving up control um, to these, these affiliates, or however you want to term them. And then the second thing was, and I, I still remember reading this twice, um, was lawyers and the legal liability issues. And I know it's not very, doesn't sound very missiological, but one, one of our leaders famously said, oh, lawyers simply don't understand missions. And I just wondered if you, if you could comment on, on those two factors on the, the inability to really become co-equals uh, globally. Oh, absolutely. Um, um, Chris, um, by the way, uh, just about the Navigator connection with Wycliffe, when I was reading these old board minutes, I kept reading about Dawson, reading Dawson Trotman's name. He was yep. a very active member of the Wycliffe board in the early years, uh, like at every meeting, when these <laughs> meetings were month monthly. So um, we appreciate that long fellowship. But in terms of, yeah, the influence of liberation theology, 60s and 80s, I was actually looking for that in our own research to see if that had any influence over these NBTOs because they were part of that, that era. And what I, what all I could conclude was we, we did not actually have much influence, a sign of that. Um, there was certainly signs for SIL in Latin America I think they were very much encountering liberation theology, the effects of it, and probably some fear around it. Uh, but it didn't seem to have the same effects up in the Pacific Islands and in Africa, where, where the NBTOs were in greater number. Uh, perhaps if there had been many in Latin America, then we may have seen that influence. But in our Latin American history at the time, it was a SIL history. There was really no Wycliffe context. So I simply have not come across that as an influence. Coming to the lawyers, though, uh, they had a lot of influence in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, when Wycliffe International was struggling with what kind of organizational structure it should have. And there was this whole issue of legal liability that was becoming mm -hmm. and risk management. Those were the, the big, we probably didn't call it risk <laughs> management at the time, but legal liability. The concern always was that if there's a court case in the United States, Wycliffe UK could lose its center at Horsley's Green because okay. of the liability flow. Mm -hmm. So if we could cut that, then each becomes autonomous, self-governing, independent, we will no longer have any legal liability problems. And those were being driven primarily by the European organizations who pressed upon the international body, which was mainly Americans, to make these changes. But it was, in, in all the documents I've read, it was certainly had the lawyers behind all of that. Um, now, that's not the whole story and that's not a totally e exact same example, but I think it's just a reminder that 
when we are dealing with international structures, we are dealing with law. Uh, uh, if our bodies are, you know, incorporated, um, we, we have those issues and often it's the lawyers who have the most to say. Lawyers are on, often on our boards as well. And so missiologically, I think the challenge is how you walk this dance, missiological dance with uh, these experts that are needed to help them uh, actually understand, well, we're actually very concerned about our legal status, but we're probably even more concerned about being faithful to God's calling, God's mission uh, for us to fulfill. I think leaders end up just doing that dance of tension, particularly in the boards uh, of our movements. Uh, so that's about the best I can do on both of those. Oh, thank you. That's, that's very helpful. I encourage you to ask more questions. Um, if not, you're going to have to hear me and my questions. <laughs> so, um, One of the things that, that just seems to come out of this, uh, Kirk, is that with the information age, and we're seeing it all the more with COVID-19, you see even the shattering of these national networks. I mean, I, I, when I arrived in Singapore, Singapore controlled the news and its groups relatively easily because things to some degree, information systems had to come in and out. Now they sit outside. Um, you get organizations that are are not just polycentric; they're like multi-poly, all right? That are 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 flying to, as as a whole group of shards in terms of identity. How do you see that as as people walking backwards in terms of a lot of these terms and frameworks that we have used historically? seem to be dissolving, and we keep seem to be entering in a world that is far more tiny pockets of groups interacting with each other, but without that sense of coherence and common identity. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think you've expressed extremely well, um, probably what we're all seeing. And if we, if, if any of us were an international mission leader, and, and I guess I was a few weeks ago, um, if I wore that hat, uh, at one level it can be quite troubling because um, you know, how do you control a ministry that's global with all its different facets and arms and structures and, and yet wants to be dynamic and inclusive of the new expressions of the church, um, but still hold enough together that you don't have mission drift, that you don't lose your way, that you uh, can actually do good, that you can actually be faithful uh, to the Lord in, in your calling, and yet be adaptable, be flexible, be open, uh, acknowledge the fact that actually it's going to be the small that have the greater impact. And one of the things I've noticed, um, i just take one network as an example. Um, you have the form of international form of Bible agencies. And this was started in, in 1974, actually, uh, John Bender Samuel, uh, again, Paul's dad, uh, and um, Fergus MacDonald, when he was head of UBS, United Bible Society, started this. And basically, it was the two big agencies, SI and UBS, and they ran everything, and, and they did for years and years. The last conference I went to, which was last year, uh, there were probably 20 or 30 small agencies, many I'd never heard of before, active players in the Bible cause. And really, it was almost felt like the big guys were relegated to the sides. Uh, they were too big. They, I mean, they were needed, the big agencies. They had stability, a track record, a history but they didn't have the nimbleness. They didn't have the flexibility. Uh, they may not have even had the IT savviness. Um, and and the, these smaller agencies probably all struggled to gain respect as well. I wonder if we, we just don't end up seeing more and more of this dynamic where the large agencies find themselves in a world that, that they don't know what to do with because it's no longer one they can adapt to. Uh, and yet, are they not still needed? Um, you know, that's that whole legacy ancestor question. When do we give these agencies up? Um, mm. and, and I think any of us who are part of an agency find that a difficult question because we don't want to give them up, but maybe their time comes. Maybe the nimbleness and flexibility of the future looks very, very different in mission and the causes the international ones to have, have massive uh, issues that they have to work through. And if they can't, uh, then they may not have that future post-COVID is looking like they really won't have much of a future if they can. 
make some of these shifts pretty quickly. So simply just to say, Tom, uh, th that's definitely something that needs further exploration as well. Okay, I'm gonna go right. to Dan. Dan, go ahead and, and unmute your mic. Yeah, thank you. I think, Kirk, you just started to get into it there. Uh, my question was, uh, this was very helpful looking back. I uh, loved your analogy too, uh, to be listening to ancestors and uh, seeing where we are. That's also a little bit easier to uh, feel and uh, grasp. Uh, you said we've looked at maybe hints of what the future holds. And I think you just started talking about that exploration uh, in that realm. Any other, uh, any other uh, senses, uh, hints, uh, resulting from your experience, where you're coming from, your studies about the future, what it's looking like? Yeah, well, thank you, Dan. It's good to see you again um, after a few months in, in, uh, in the UK there. Um, Okay, now I wear a different hat. I'm no longer the head of Wycliffe Club Alliance. I have nothing to lose in my answer here. I'm not about to get fired uh, from <laughs> that job. I, I would actually say that the future, and, and Paul Bender Samuel, who was on my board, is no longer on that board either, so he, he can't even report me back to them that I've become a radical. But to be honest, uh, I would say my biggest struggle as I was leaving, uh, leading the Wycliffe Club Alliance was the large Western, actually they weren't all Western, but the large uh, agencies that were part of the, the Global Alliance who, who, um, who had no, they didn't seem to have a very clear missiological understanding of themselves. Uh, it probably wasn't important to them, very pragmatic in nature. Um, kind of let's get the job done, whatever it takes, uh, very good Protestant work ethic from that point of view. They worried me the most because their whole model was based on a whole set of assumptions. That being that you're gonna have a steady stream of recruits, you're gonna have a steady stream of income, even steady stream of prayers, and you're gonna have access to the world as you've known it. Um, they were not listening to any of the conversations, uh, not listening very well in my opinion, to any of these major conversations over the last years of where we were trying to bring together these polycentric global voices and actually saying, well, the indigenous voice is seeing things this way, um, the, the voice from the South uh, or even the Russian voice or wherever it may be is, is, is seeing it differently and we put it all together and it looks quite different structurally. Uh, there's less ownership of an organizational structure. There's even less need of it, especially at a global level. These larger agencies really just weren't listening. Um, and so I don't know what they're thinking right now with COVID, but I'm pretty much sure their model of the future has just been decimated. Um, let me quickly give you an example. I, I was in on a call recently where um, I heard, I was listening to some mission leaders talk about, about you know, COVID, post-COVID, and some were stuck on the fact that they wouldn't be able to, to send anymore. You might even have been on that call uh, with the Mission Commission, World Evangelical Alliance Mission Commission. I don't know who, who, who here was in on that call, but a couple were seeming to say, our model is stuck because we have all these people to send and we can't send them. And what do we do? And I sat there thinking, okay, I'm really sad about that, but this was, this was coming for a long time. Just this point was coming. Uh, we didn't know it would be COVID, but the point was coming where this whole idea, we're just always gonna be able to send, always gonna be able to do it our way. Don't have to worry too much about partnerships. Certainly don't have to take the local church that seriously. Um, that's all, all, all I believe uh, will, is fundamentally changed. And so uh, where are we going from here? I think unless our agencies are, are, are express uh, this humility and nimbleness and giving up a lot of our structure, a lot of how we've done things, um, then I, I wonder if we, we really do have the future we think we might. Um, so Dan, I, I think um, it's far more, uh, it's, gonna, it's, it's gotta be relational. It's got to be, um, you know, uh, relational from the point of view of human relationships, but relational in terms of our relationship with our trying God and mission, understanding uh, and discerning better with him and letting go of, of our ministries to the extent that uh, things get completely reshaped. Um, probably not many of us 
are going to feel that we can do that or that our boards would be willing for us to do that because we uh, there is so much of history involved uh, in our agencies. So that's probably as far as I'm willing to take it without getting shot by any um, uh, Wycliffe or SI leaders. Actually, I don't know if we have any SI leaders on the call. If we do, don't quote me, but I would actually say SIL has less than five years of ministry left because it can't shift its model fast enough, mm. um, particularly with the global church. And I would suggest that the NBTO history that I've just painted is a big part of the problem. This whole um, you know, lack of in, in, incorporation inclusion of the national leadership that it could have embraced much, much earlier, didn't figure out how to do it. Now it's a bit too late uh, and, and the world has kept moving. Well, Kirk, now you're in, real, you're in real trouble. Don't Paul, me. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> anyway, Paul wants to ask you a question. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I've already sent an email to, to the chair of the board. Um, <laughs> I, I, I love the, um, uh, the way you concluded, uh, Kirk, and this idea of local embeddedness and glo uh, a global connectedness as, as, in so as something to aspire towards. Um, but my question, and it, it, it does really pick up and follow on from what Dan's just asked you, which is to what degree in your research, because you, you've been talking to us about what shapes identity, what um, enables people to have a sense of participation, both in what they're doing locally, but as, as something that's bigger than them. And um, I, I just wonder, um, is there something fundamentally um, difficult um, in identity between those agencies that understand mission primarily in terms of the sending, which you've just talked about, and by sending they mean international crossing borders sending, and those parts, those expressions of the church that are understanding mission as being sent into the world as opposed to sent geographically, and, and therefore uh, it can still be cross-cultural, of course, within their own context, uh, but where they see um, that calling to their own context and so on. And, uh, is there a fundamental um, dissonance between these two identities and can they actually be reconciled? Uh, have you seen that? Can they be reconciled and held together within a, a global um, alliance or some other structure? Yeah, I actually had a feeling you were going to ask a question like that. And um, so I came prepared, of course, and, 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 I, and I'd actually go back to, you know, in a sense, you could say, say the study, and that is that um, when you had the sending, the traditional sending, therefore the Wycliffe division sending to SIL, who receives them and then carries out its work, SIL, if it used local citizens, uh, the local expression of sending, it, it actually often used them as um, language helpers or assistants, but not fully embodied necessarily within their organizational structure for all the reasons I've already given. And then you had these national expressions, and, and they weren't just the NBTOs, they can be national denominations, they can be other ministries. Um, you know, in, in Latin America, you have agencies like FEDEMEC in, in Costa Rica that are interagency. You have all these different expressions. They, they may be a combination uh, of sending out uh, overseas somewhere, as well as sending within the church, within their own context, uh, local, uh, global, uh, and everything in between. And where there's been the greater uh, ability to work together and assimilate, I would suggest, uh, sure, the Global Alliance structure helped when, when we changed that 1990 and reconfigured it in 2008 and further changes in 2015-16 where the original organizations gave up their birthright so that all could be conclude, included provided they met certain criteria. And it was that criteria that brought them together and, and I guess that's the point. What is it that brings us together? In the past it was the ability to send, to raise money, to raise prayer support. You know, it was all about the often the individual. Uh, or join a team and, and do it and then go and do it, do your ministry. But 
Um, and so that was the criteria. What's the criteria for today um, in, in a global body? In, in our case, it was not about you had to have the Wycliffe DNA. It wasn't even about that you had to make Bible translation your primary focus. Instead, it could be you, you would make it part of your focus. And so for that part of your focus, you were included into this global body, this family, this community um, that had minimum controls over you, uh, minimal financial expectations. And you were uh, allowed to participate equally to the extent of even the historical organizations who helped started the whole movement. You got to sit equally. Uh, we used the metaphor early on about we, we would only meet around a round table. There were no longer rectangular tables with a person sitting at the end in charge. They were always round because everyone was equal. All voices were to be heard. Uh, multilingual, you know, all the meetings and, and, and interaction had to be multilingual. Uh, this, this, you know, the scale of doing that just becomes very, very difficult for probably many, many movements. But if we don't become multilingual, if we don't accept each other around a, a table where the power distance is, is done respectfully, but all are included. Uh, these to me are the basics of body life of community. Unless you deal with those, then I don't know how you can incorporate uh, the tensions uh, uh, that these different uh, parties might have, uh, even in their understanding of something as basic as sending and being sent. So to me, it comes back to those, those fundamentals. They have to be right uh, and they take a lot of work. Um, I've got a, um... A, a written question, Gregor, this is probably better last one, but can you speak to the issue of the relationship between polycentrism and money? Or to what uh, extent is money an issue? And can polycentrism truly be realized and empowered when funding for uh, mission initiatives uh, tend to still be predominantly dominated by the West and in particular North America? Uh, thank you. Yeah, again, excellent question. And, and so quick answer, as quick as I can make it, is that um, I, I think part of the polycentric conversation about money is actually a conversation about generosity. Uh, one of my colleagues, Nidia Garcia Schmidt in, in Latin America, is leading conversations around generosity, trying to shift the conversation away from money and saying, what has God already put in our hands and how do we be generous with it? Mm -hmm. uh, whether we're an indigenous community or we're a Brazilian mainline church denomination. And that would be an example of bringing the polycentric flavor or way of thinking and meeting and, and influencing a conversation that shifts from everything has to come from somewhere else because we're too poor or impoverished or we haven't been taught to give to rather shifting it to, to God being a generous God. And missiologically, that's also where I sit. I think we haven't actually done enough about generosity as a missiological topic. Um, actually, Nidia, uh, who I mentioned, hope to do a doctorate just around that very theme and do some doctoral research in Latin America around how can generosity become a movement. And then I think we, we start mitigating uh, some of this very strong influence from the U.S. church, which is a generous church. And by the way, I have a lot of U.S. supporters, so I, I fully appreciate their generosity. Um, and they are quite unaware of, of some of these uh, power dynamics uh, that American money makes. Uh, some of the ministries I'm familiar with are funded by just a couple of very wealthy uh, North American donors. And yet, if those donors have, have a failure in their business because of COVID, these whole ministries uh, could po possibly collapse. Because once you, you are a participant of that, that kind of funding, then you shift your focus away from generosity, from local expressions, um, uh, gifts in kind, and other forms of generosity. So again, missiologically, I think that's a big problem. It's a theological problem, a teaching problem. It's a paternalistic problem. It's a dependency problem all, all rolled in one. And so we don't have enough time to deal with it, but uh, certainly there's a, there's a lot of connection between po a polycentric way of thinking, funding, and generosity uh, that could be explored further if we had more time. Well, Kirk, with that, we'll, we'll 